When I first heard about solar engineering as an atmospheric chemist, I thought this was an absolutely crazy idea and even considering this was really quite out there. For a long time, it was considered kind of a fringe or a wacky idea for a couple of reasons. I mean, in part, this, this stuff sounds like science fiction and it also sounds like a desperate type of human response. The more I learned about climate change and where that is taking us and humanity, the more I got worried about this. If in 10, 15 years, humanity finds itself in a real crisis and populations really demand that decision makers take action now, not words, but actions, then one of the few things you can do to take fast action is stratospheric geoengineering. And I think if we haven't done research on this, despite how crazy this idea is, then that's a really bad idea. In the end, the risk of not doing research on this may be bigger than the risk of doing research. Climate engineering is an umbrella term for a set of um, imagined technological responses to climate change. And I say imagined because most of the technologies that are being talked about are only on the chalkboard at this point. The latest front runner is solar geoengineering, a plan that would disperse particles into the stratosphere and could reduce global temperatures by bouncing the sun's rays back into space. It's an idea that picked up steam over a decade ago when a famous scientist called for more research. Crutzen won the Nobel Prize for his work on the atmospheric chemistry of ozone depletion. And he wrote a paper which made the case for investigation into solar geoengineering as a response to climate change. Basically, he said, we're not getting there fast enough just with political means. And so we scientists and technologists have to see if there are additional things that can be done. There's a previous report by the IPCC. And what comes out of that is fundamentally, in just a few years, our emissions have to be zero, not half in 2030 and zero in 2050. And so I'm like, well, there's absolutely zero chance this will happen. With growing urgency and scientific interest, a team at Harvard University took up the charge to investigate solar geoengineering in a fully fledged research program. From my perspective, before you perturb a system, it probably is a good idea to understand the system. So one has to understand that in a climate system, everything is coupled together. Where we live in the troposphere, there's a huge variety of particles. It turns out in the stratosphere, it's much, much simpler. You have emissions of sulfur containing compounds in the troposphere, they make their way up all the way into the stratosphere. They find each other and start making little particles. That's the natural aerosol that exists in the stratosphere. A major source of these sulfur compounds are volcanic eruptions. When Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines, it blew nearly 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. That surplus created a blanket that cooled the Earth by 0.5 degrees Celsius for roughly 15 months. Scientists see this as a proxy for solar geoengineering's potential. But these sulfate aerosols come with consequences. We know that on these highly acidic surfaces of these aerosols, reactions occur that can result in ozone depletion. We also know based on the molecular properties of sulfuric acid and water that this absorbs radiation and that heats up the stratosphere. I'm thinking, are there materials that could have less side effects? This is what Jen Dai, a PhD student at Harvard, is investigating. She built this tabletop experiment to explore alternative particles that could potentially cool the planet and minimize risks to the ozone. Cosmic carbonate is interesting mostly because of its chemical properties. Specifically, it's kind of a common thing that we see every day. It's in toothpaste, it's a whitener for paper. It's relatively safe for human beings. We use something called a flow tube experiment, where basically your particles sit on kind of a tube inside the flow tube there. And then you have an injector that just comes in through the tube. We'll basically push the injector upstream of the particles so that the gas would interact with the particles. We suspect that if we put those calcite particles into the stratosphere, they might interact with the acidic species, such as hydrogen chloride, and sequester some of those. And those species happen to be related to ozone loss. Even with this experimentation, the Harvard team is aware of its limits. How much trust would anybody have that these researchers at Harvard have replicated the complexity of the stratosphere in a little flow tube of one meter? And I would hope most people would say, well, I don't quite know whether that's sufficient for me to put my trust in. I'm not going to tell the world, you know, yes, just trust my lab results. I want to know how it actually behaves. That means you have to intentionally put some of it into the stratosphere. Scopex is the stratospheric controlled perturbation experiment. We're going to have a balloon that's going to be at 20 kilometers. Below that, we're going to have what we call an equipment gondola. 
that's sort of hanging here, it will have all the instrumentation in it. So in there, we're gonna have a system to disperse aerosols, a few hundred grams of calcium carbonate, less material than a normal airplane flight actually puts out in the atmosphere. It makes what we call a plume behind it. What we want to do is then turn around and sort of fly back through this plume at various points in it. And that actually, in a way, is a little bit like our flow tube in a lab. It is a truly small experiment. From the material we're gonna place there, it will have absolutely zero impact on the ground. But the idea is that we'll be able to learn, does the air around our particle evolve the way we think it should based on our lab model. I want to actually find out as much as possible what are the effects of doing this and risks. We're slowly getting these things together. We will test them in the lab. We have a big chamber where we can sort of reduce the pressure to stratospheric pressures. I think we're just at the beginning of thinking about how to do these experiments. Before it even takes flight, the Harvard team set up an advisory committee that's acting as an independent check on their developments. We want to try to have Scopics not just be a, an experiment that can advance science of geoengineering, but to also make sure that it's done in a way that tries to exemplify good governance. One thing to make clear is that even if we're technologically ready, we're going to have to wait for the advisory committee and see whether they think that we've really done all the things they expect us to do this. Solar geoengineering was recently on the agenda at the UN Environmental Assembly to kickstart a global conversation. Because if a country decides in 10 to 15 years that they need to act fast with a massive fleet of aircraft, there are systematic unknowns to bear in mind. The problem is if we find out at some point, oh, there's a big side effect, we need to stop this now. What's going to happen is you're going to jump back up to that steep point in the steeple curve, and that's called termination shock, because you're sort of giving the system a really hard shock by just stopping. Scopex is a very small experiment before we even get to that scenario. But still, it's been a lightning rod for criticism. I think the reason Scopex has ignited so much controversy is not because of the actual physical impact, but the symbolism of the experiment. The first is the so-called slippery slope. If you start with the small-scale experiment, then that just kind of opens the door. It's a larger-scale investigation. The second reason is that lots of folks see this type of work as a distraction from what they think really needs to happen. Emissions abatement, adaptation, that's where the game should be. And something like solar geoengineering might serve as an excuse for some people to kind of take their foot off the gas pedal on those more important forms of climate action. And with this conversation comes another source of controversy. The chemtrails conspiracy suggests that solar geoengineering is already taking place through this chemtrails activity. That's a myth. Chemtrails are, are not a real thing. I know lots of people are going to disagree with me on that, but there's no scientific evidence. If this research effort shows geoengineering's benefits outweigh its risks, it could potentially reduce global temperatures. It would not fix the root cause, which is the rising funnel of greenhouse gas emissions that are getting trapped in our atmosphere. I think if we're not having strong action on emissions, pursuing stratospheric geoengineering is quite risky because then we have this mirage of something that helps us. The only reasonable way to even consider something as contentious as this is as one small component of a portfolio of response options. Often consideration of climate change is not based on science. It's based on ideology. It's based on our belief systems. If you believe that human beings got into this mess because they're hubristic and because technology has run away from us, then you're probably opposed to even consideration of solar geoengineering. It just seems like a bad idea. If, on the other hand, you believe that scientists are kind of the last bulwark that we have against coming climate chaos, then you might give license to scientists to kind of do investigation in this area because we need to know what's out there. It's these clashing worldviews that makes the consideration of solar geoengineering and, frankly, climate action writ large so contentious. I really hope humanity gets its act together and actually goes after solving that problem fast enough that in the end, we will never have to consider actually doing this. But I'm not convinced we're doing this. The ability to solve global problems as a global community, I think, has not improved in the last years. And that makes me even more concerned about this and that we will not be able to fix this problem in time.